Well, good morning. morning. Delighted to have you worshiping with us today here at First Baptist Church. We have been uh, going through a series in uh, the Advent season called The Lights of Christmas. And today we're going to continue that series with The Light of Love and then invite you back tonight at 6 p.m. for our conclusion to our uh, Advent celebration together as a church. I'm going to invite you to stand with me if you would. Our passage for this morning's message is taken from 1 John chapter 4, and I'm going to invite you to read along with me, beginning there in verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God into the world, that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, today we are humbled as we read this passage of Scripture. It uh, grips our hearts to think that You are love personified. And we will spend eternity discovering just what that means. Because your love is perfect. Your love is eternal. In some sense, it's beyond our comprehension. And yet you have so richly displayed your love through the manifestation of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for displaying your love among us. Today, Father, we pray that your Spirit would open the Word to our hearts and minds, that it would be illuminated, and that we would understand and grasp it, and that it would find a home in our lives each day. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We've talked several times over the past months about the confusion that is resident in our world. And so I don't want to belabor that point this morning, but I do just want to make mention once again that our world is a confusing and a confused place. And one of the ways that that confusion is manifested is with regards to God. People in our culture have tremendous confusion on the subject of God. And who is God and what is God all about? Some people think the universe is God. Others believe that people are gods. Some think that there are thousands or even millions of gods, and others say, God, give me a break. That's the stuff of fairy tale and legend and mythology. Well, today we're going to consider what the Bible has to say about God. Who is this God that has loved us? How has he revealed himself? And what has he revealed of himself to us? Psalm 19 and 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. So as the Creator, God's handiwork is evident in creation. This is what theologians would refer to as natural revelation, or general revelation. And it reveals the invisible attributes of God, His eternal power, and His Godhead. Now this general revelation demonstrates the glory of God in the creation, in the preservation, and in the governance of the universe. And so it teaches us that God is not an impersonal force. You know, like you go to see Star Wars, let the force be with you. Well, that's okay for fairy tales and for fantasy. But God is not an impersonal force. He is a living personal creator, one who possesses immense power, great intelligence, and unparalleled glory. The great theologian John Calvin in his Institutes writes, God's essence indeed is incomprehensible, utterly transcending all human thought. But on each of his works, his glory is engraven in characters so bright, so distinct, and so illustrious that none, however dull and illiterate, can plead ignorance as their excuse. 
Natural revelation. General revelation. It's a wonderful provision, but in fact, it is limited in its purpose. You see, general revelation is general in the sense that it is given universally to mankind. It demonstrates the existence of God. It demonstrates the power of God. It it expresses the glory of God. And yet, general or natural revelation is not sufficient for understanding God. It does not reveal the will of God. It says nothing about man's fallen condition, nor of his need for salvation. In fact, in order to know that, we must have special revelation. Aren't you glad that God has given us special revelation? Hebrews chapter 1 tells us, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds. So God has provided special revelation. He's done that through the words of the prophets of old that have been inscripturated in the Old and New Testaments. And in these last days, He has revealed Himself through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is by this special revelation that God has revealed His character in vivid detail. He's revealed His plan for mankind. He has revealed His purpose for creation itself. What then has God revealed to us concerning Himself? What do we know about God? Now, the Bible is filled with teachings about God. How many of you would agree with me on that? I mean, from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, it is chock full of teachings about God. Talk, talks to us about His character, talks to us about His attributes, gives us uh, evidence of His purposes and His plans. It speaks of His will toward His creation. Well, today we're in 1 John. And the writings of St. John contain three encompassing statements about the nature of God. The words of the Lord Jesus are recorded in John chapter 4. And there it tells us that God is spirit. Turn and tell your neighbor, God is spirit. God is spirit. And then in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it tells us that God is light. God is light. So God is spirit. God is light. And then we saw in our text that we've selected for today, God is love. So this speaks of his benevolence towards his creation. Well, this morning we're going to consider this third aspect of God, that God is love. And specifically, we're going to consider the manifestation of God's love and the mandate of God's love. We begin then by considering the manifestation of God's love. Look again with me at verse 9 of our text. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. I want you to notice there that God has manifested His love through the Lord Jesus Christ. God has sent His only begotten Son into the world. The only begotten Son. Interesting title. In fact, this is not the only place in Holy Scripture where this title is used. It's used by John again in the Gospel of John. Chapter 1, verse 14 tells us, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Watch this. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is this only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth? Well, if you go back to the prologue of of John's Gospel, just at the beginning of this pericope, it tells us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Then you jump down here to verse 14 and, it's, and it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have beheld His glory, the glory as of what? The only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the only begotten of the Father is the Word of God, who was with God and who was God Himself. And the Word became flesh. This is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. This tells us that Jesus took upon Himself human flesh. He added humanity to His deity. And Jesus didn't simply appear as a man, He became a man. He who was with God in the beginning emptied Himself. He took on the form of a bondservant made in the likeness of men. As God's presence was with the children of Israel in the wilderness, in the tabernacle of Moses. So Jesus has tabernacled with man. It pleased the Father for the fullness of the Godhead to be present in the Son, through whom He made the worlds. God manifested His love through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he manifested his love through Jesus in order to be a propitiation. A propitiation. Look again at verse 10. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation. It's a theological term. What does it mean? Well, in its simplest definition, propitiation speaks of satisfaction. It is the satisfaction of the wrath of God against sin. To propitiate means to satisfy the wrath of God. And specifically to satisfy the wrath of God against sin. Now, you'd probably agree with me that wrath is a loaded term, is it not? (laughs) People don't like to talk about wrath, especially the wrath of God. They shy away from that. It, It just, it rubs us the wrong way. It's like petting a cat backwards. Wrath of God. Our culture doesn't want to talk about the wrath of God. Our culture wants to talk about the love of God. Do we not? But if we really are going to appreciate the love of God in all of its full glory, then it must be cast as a diamond against the black darkness of His wrath upon sin. For it is from that wrath that Jesus was born to save us. To save us from the wrath of God. The divine punishment based on God's angry judgment. God is angry with sin. And that, I would say, is even more troublesome than wrath. Wrath is a loaded word. Anger is an ugly word. Anger is a word that we don't like to think of in terms of God being angry. It's a troublesome word. Now, human anger suggests a sense of injustice toward the one offended. Suggests a sense of a desire for revenge. Perhaps even a surprise at the offense. But divine anger does not contain that sense of revenge or surprise. And yet... God is angry with sin. In fact, the psalmist writes, God is a just judge and God is angry with the wicked every day. What a beautiful Christmas message. (laughs) But it's true. God is just. God is judge. 
And God is angry with the wicked. Divine anger is a reality. So what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that God flies off the handle. It doesn't mean that God is overly sensitive. It doesn't mean that God is easily offended. He's not a snowflake. It doesn't mean that God is surprised by sin and therefore capriciously punishes us in order to get even. Because you've offended me. And now I've got to get back at you. It doesn't mean any of those things. So what does it mean? How are we to understand the anger of God? Well, if we're going to get a handle and begin to understand something of the anger of God, it must be understood in relation to His role, His holiness, and His character. Let's consider each one of those. Regarding His role, He is creator of heaven and earth. Now, I want to unpack this a bit because it's so easy to let those words just roll off your tongue without really thinking about what they mean. God is the creator of heaven and earth. Let that sink in. He and He alone is the creator of heaven and earth. That tells us that the universe had a beginning. And of course, that's what the scriptures declare. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When did He create them? In the beginning. When was that? In the beginning. <laughs> That's what it was. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And science confirms that the universe had a beginning. That the universe is not eternal. A couple of proofs that the world of science gives us. First of all, it is expanding. The universe is expanding. This was confirmed by the Hubble telescope many, many years ago. And that means if the universe is expanding, then if you were to push a giant rewind button and roll time back, the universe would be contracting. And it would contract all the way back to a solitary point where it began. When? The beginning. When God said, let there be light. And he unleashed his creative power and brought the universe into existence. But the world of science also tells us that the universe is winding down. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. That is to say that the universe is losing usable energy. Like a massive clock, it is winding down. And what that tells us is that like a massive clock, at one time it had to be wound up. These are proofs that the universe did indeed have a beginning. And we could spend all morning just talking about other evidences that have come from the world of science, but we will not because there's much more in this passage to unpack. Well, the universe is defined by three characteristics. Time space, and matter. Time, space, and matter. And that means that whatever, or more properly, whomever brought forth the universe into existence had to be spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. Sound like a definition for God? In fact, it is. He is the spaceless one, the timeless one, the immaterial one. He is a personal God. How do I know? Because He chose to create. Immaterial forces do not choose anything. Only a living conscience can make a choice. God chose to create. He is personal. He is powerful. He created something from nothing. How do I know it was nothing? Because again, the universe had a beginning. Time, space, and matter had a beginning. The universe is not eternal. So before the universe existed, there was nothing. Only God. And in fact, the Bible confirms that it was 
ex nihilo that he created, which means out of nothing. So that those things that are seen were made from that which is not seen. That which is beyond the material world. And so he's very powerful. He's also intelligent because he created a finely tuned and ordered universe. Do you realize that if the earth were, was just a fraction of a degree closer to the sun, it would be incinerated? If it was just a fraction of a degree further from the sun, it would be so cold it would not be able to sustain life. It is precisely ordered and finely tuned, this universe, created by a powerful super intelligence. Of course, we also know that God is immaterial, right? The words of Jesus, God is what? Spirit. God is spirit. Unlike matter, which had a beginning, God is eternal. He is the uncaused cause. He's the unmoved mover. He is the first cause. The one who brought all things into existence and through whom all things exist. Very powerful implication is that God is the giver of life. He is the uncaused cause. He's the only being who existed before the universe of time, space, and matter. And therefore, he is the giver of life. God and God alone. Deuteronomy 30.20 confirms this. The Lord is your life. Job 33 and 4. The breath of the Almighty gives life. 1 Timothy 6 and 13, God gives life to all things. Psalm 36 and 9, with God is the fountain of life. And John 5 and 26, the words of Jesus, God has life in Himself. That's a powerful expression. And it leads to a profound and sobering reality. I want you to sit up on your, on your seat and really listen to this. Separation from God is separation from life itself. For He is the source of all life. Think of it like this. I have a laptop that I use and I have plugged into the wall most of the time. But occasionally I'll unplug that laptop and, you know, take it to the kitchen, have a cup of coffee or whatever. And everything's just fine and dandy because it still has power. In the battery. But if I leave that laptop unplugged from the power source long enough, you know what happens? The battery dies. And when the battery dies, the computer is useless. Can't do anything with it. Has, has no power. Likewise, creation derives its life from God. Hebrews 1.3, Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. Colossians 1.17 says of the Lord Jesus, before, he was before all things and by him all things consist. Think about it this way. God is creator, therefore he is the source of all life. God is the one and the only one who possesses non-contingent life. To be separated from God is to be separated from life itself. This is further proof that Jesus is God. For he says that God possesses life in himself and he is given for the Son to possess life in himself. Incontingent. Not dependent upon anyone or anything for sustenance. For God is life. The very source of life. Well, God's anger is also to be understood in, re in relation to his holiness. God is holy. And the angels around the throne sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. What, what, what did they have a speech impediment that they would repeat themselves so often? No. It is, it is, a, it is a cause or a, 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 a manner of emphasis in the, in the Hebrew language. You know, they didn't have different fonts like we have where you could italicize something or put it in bold or underline it or put exclamation points by it. 
And so one of their favorite uh, tools to use to get a point across when they really wanted to emphasize something, repetition. They would repeat it over and over and over again. And those of you who have been here long enough have said, yeah, Pastor Greg, you're pretty good at that. Because you just keep repeating things over and over and over again. We get it. (laughs) But how many of you know we have to be reminded of those things that we've been taught? So what do the angels repeat to get the point across? Love, love, love? No. Mercy, mercy, mercy? No. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. That those other attributes of God are true, but the one that is being driven home for eternity is that God is holy. So what does that mean? He's holy. Well, there are a couple of of, uh, definitions of the word holy, two primary meanings of the word holy, if you will. The first meaning is to say that God is separate that God is different, that God is wholly other. He's transcendent. He's higher than and outside of creation itself. To say God is holy is to remind us that He is creator and everything else is created. That God is in a category all unto Himself. He is holy, separate, different, transcendent, holy, other. But then the second meaning, God is morally pure. He is undefiled. He is perfect. And that means that, he, that sin cannot coexist in God's presence. Sin cannot persist in the presence of God. And that has serious and far-reaching consequences for men. Why? Because by nature we are sinners. We're sinners. Now the scripture helps us to make sense of this by distinguishing between the omnipresence of God and the manifest presence of God. We're going deep today, so I want you to really pay attention. But the omnipresence of God refers to his everywhere presence. That he is all-seeing, that he is all-knowing. That the Bible makes it clear, there's nowhere you can go in all of creation and escape his presence. Even in the bowels of hell itself, there is a sense of God's omnipresence. Can't escape from it. His omnipresence. But the manifest presence of God refers to his direct presence, his unbridled display of glory, the manifest presence of God. And while God is omnipresent, in some sense, he partitions off his manifest glory from the material world, at least in this dispensation of time. Now, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. That is, creation itself gives evidence of his glory. It doesn't say that creation itself manifests in full uh, reality his glory. But it gives evidence. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We see the evidence of God's glory in creation. And so, that is, creation gives evidence of his glory. And yet his glory, his proper glory, is shielded from the material universe. The prophet Habakkuk referred to this as the hiding of his power. Isaiah referred to the God of Israel as a God who hides himself. The psalmist writes, clouds and thick darkness surround him. So in some sense, God partitions off his manifest glory from the material universe in this current dispensation of time. How do I know? (laughs) It's it's easy. I mean, there there are several proofs, not the least of which is 
When was the last time you looked into the face of Jesus Christ? You haven't. Why not? Because he is here by his spirit dwelling in you. And yet in his full physicality, he is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high where he makes intercession for us. And oh, I want to see him look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. One of these days, when we pass through the veil, we will be in the manifest presence of God, looking upon the face of Jesus Christ, who is the very image of the invisible God. Amen. If that doesn't excite you, I don't know what will. So in some sense, God partitions off his manifest glory from the material universe in this dispensation. But there will come a day when this world will pass away and there will be a new heaven and a new earth wherein God will manifest himself as he tabernacles with us. Can you say amen? And that is good. It's good that he partitions off his manifest glory from his material universe in some sense. It's merciful, it's kind, it's charitable. Why? Because sin cannot exist in the direct manifest presence of God. Habakkuk tells us, our God is an all-consuming fire. Lamentations tells us that it is by his mercy that we are not consumed. Realize that. Realize that the partitioning off of his manifest glory is his mercy towards us. It is by his mercies that we are not consumed. Today, sinful man lives in the omnipresence of God, where he is free to curse God and still draw breath by his grace. Yet even in the omnipresence of God, sin is exacting a deadly toll. We are sinners. We are separated from God's manifest presence. We are cut off from his life-giving brilliance, the life-giving brilliance of his glory. Now as Christians, there's another side to that. <laughs> Because we are under the blood of Jesus Christ and now through his spirit he dwells within us. We have received of his spirit. And that's an amazing mystery. And yet as a whole, as a race, we are stumbling in darkness. And even as Christians, we struggle to understand the mind of Christ. If we're serious about scriptural interpretation, do we not? We wrestle with it. And, we, and I pray as I'm preparing the messages, God, show me. And there are times I'll read things and I'll sit back in my chair and I'll say, what do you mean? What? Help me. That shouldn't surprise us. Our brains are only three pounds. <laughs> You're not going to fully comprehend the God of the universe with a three-pound brain. I would say that even when we pass into his presence, it will take all of eternity for us to continually discover the mind of God and the love of God and the deep riches of God that are buried in the treasure that is Jesus Christ. You're not going to get bored in eternity. You're going to be having new delights break upon your conscience continually. Go, wow, I thought I had a handle on this. I'm just starting, just beginning. He's eternal. So as a race, we're stumbling. We're suffering in decay. We are dying. You know how I know? Because I looked in the mirror this morning. <laughs> my hair was exploded all over my head and I was digging crust out of my eyes. And I'm looking at it going, oh man. Dying, decaying, second law of thermodynamics, winding down. Need to be wound up again. Thank God for caffeine. <laughs> yeah. 
So listen, although we exist in his omnipresence, we will not persist in his omnipresence. The battery of creation is wearing down. So the Bible says, Romans 8.22, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. The clock of time is winding down. But what's even more alarming, while we temporarily exist as sinners in His omnipresence, we will never exist as sinners in His manifest presence. Because it is impossible for sin to defile the direct presence of God who is holy, who is morally pure, who is undefiled. A couple of scriptural examples would be in order. Think about the high priests on Yom Kippur, right? The Day of Atonement. The high priest was allowed one day and one day only, Yom Kippur, to go into the Holy of Holies where the ark was, that earthly representation of the very throne of God, upon which God would manifest in measure His glory. But before the high priest could pass through the veil into the Holy of Holies, he first had to offer for himself a sin offering. And then they would tie a rope around his ankle in case he perished in the manifest presence of God's glory. They could drag him out without going in themselves and being smitten. And then he would collect the blood from the offering and he would go into the Holy of Holies where he would present the blood upon the mercy seat above the Ark of the Covenant. He had to be purified himself else he would perish in the glorious presence of God. Another example, the moving of the ark from Baal Judah to Jerusalem. David wanted to bring the ark, the ark of the Covenant back from this city into the holy city of Jerusalem. And so they made preparations and they placed the ark of the covenant on an ox cart a whole other message there. Weren't supposed to do that. Had no authority to do that. But they did. Put it on the ox cart. They're bringing the Ark of the Covenant on this ox cart to Jerusalem. And as they're going along and it's a parade and they are singing and they're worshiping and all of this great pageantry and fanfare and one of the oxen stumbles and the ox cart is upset and the ark looks like it's going to fall into the mud. And Uzzah, one that was helping to move the ark along, feared that the ark would be defiled by falling into the mud. And so he stretched forth his hand to steady it. And as soon as his hand hit the Ark of the Covenant, he was struck dead by the holy power of God. And it really messed up David. David was so angry at the Lord for doing this that he just pushed pause and said, let the Ark stay where it's at. It's not coming to Jerusalem. And he was upset. He did not understand. Friends, we've got to be so careful. There's a whole other message here. We've got to be so careful of when we as, as frail and finite human beings would dare to judge the morals of a holy God and say, that was unjust. How could you do such a thing? But I want you to recognize the mistake that Uzzah was making was that in his proud arrogance, he dared to believe that he could spare the defilement of the ark by touching it with his fleshly hands that were not pure. You see, had the ark of the covenant fallen onto the ground, it would not have been defiled by the earth. The earth was just doing what the earth does. It was just being ground. Dust when it's dry, mud when it's wet. But the defiled sinful hand of Uzzah would defile the Ark of the Covenant. He touched the Ark and the holiness of God proceeded from his presence and struck him dead. 
The holiness of God is nothing to trifle with. Nadab and Abihu, sons of the priest, tried to approach God on illegitimate terms and they took fire that was strange fire. It wasn't fire that had been prepared for its purpose. And when they presented that strange fire before God, the Bible says that immediately they were incinerated on the spot. The holiness of God is nothing to be trifled with. The children of Israel in the wilderness, when they came to Mount Sinai, and Moses ascended the hill to receive from God the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And as he goes up the mountain, God tells him to tell the children of Israel, stay away from the mountain. Don't even lay your foot at the foot of the mountain, because if you do, you will be struck dead. Now listen, these prohibitions against sin were not because God was angry with the people in a human sense of anger, that God hated the people, that God delighted in killing those who desired to be in his presence. These prohibitions against allowing sin into God's presence were given because God loved his people and he was protecting them. Remember, he is holy. And sin cannot exist in his manifest holy presence. Think of it like this. Fire is quenched when it is immersed in water. Darkness is dispelled when the sun rises. Sin is consumed when God manifests his presence in all of its glory. Like a candle of wax before fire. So God's anger must be understood in relation to his role as creator, in relation to his holiness, but also in relation to his character. Because in the midst of all of this talk about wrath and anger, let's go back to verse 8 of our text and remind ourselves, God is love. Aren't you glad God is love? God is love. God is love personified. And that means that all true, all undefiled, all righteous, all selfless, all sacrificial love comes from God. Not from us. Not because, well, you know, we're just basically good. No. When you and I express righteous love, when we express undefiled love, when we express love that is selfless and love that is sacrificial, we are but reflecting the image of the God in whom we were created. We were created in his image. We're reflecting his image as we love others like Jesus loved. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 5, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. To lay down one's life for his friends. And that's precisely what God did in sending his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Verse 10 of chapter 4 says, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. I want you to notice here that God's love was self-initiating. We did not initiate God's love. God is eternal. That means that his attributes are eternal. And so God has been possessing these attributes from before time began. God is spirit. He is the transcendent one. We talked about this. The omnipotent, mighty creator, the immaterial one beyond space. That he is light. And that speaks of his omniscience, that he sees all, that he knows all, that he is eternal. He's outside of time. He's the ancient of days. The alpha and what? The alpha and the omega. And God is love. So throughout eternity past, the members of the Godhead have enjoyed fellowship. 
The members of the Trinity have been enjoying eternal love forever. Love that is eternal. Fellowship that is eternal. We did not initiate God's love. We did not initiate God's love for us. God's love was self-initiating. In fact, we did not even love God. Romans 5.10 tells us, When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. So prior to salvation, we were the enemies of God. Now how many of you would agree with me that Jesus died for His friends? He said, Greater love has no one than this, that He laid down His life for His friends. But what's so amazing is that when he died for his friends, his friends weren't his friends. <laughs> his friends were his enemies when he died for them. We did not initiate God's love, nor did we earn it. In fact, there is nothing at all that we could do about our sin. Romans 5, 6 tells us, For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So as sinners, we were without strength. We had no strength against the power of sin, no strength against uh, the powers of darkness, no strength to please the holy nature of God, no strength to live righteous lives. Powerless against sin, powerless against Satan, powerless against death, powerless against hell. And, verse 6, we were ungodly. So we were the opposite of godly. We were ungodly. We were the opposite of holy. We were unholy. We were morally impure. And yet because of his great love in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. It's amazing. And so we sing joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. <coughs> Friends, that's the good news of the gospel. That is the story of Christmas. A love that's eternal, a love that's self-initiating, a love that is sacrificial. So what are the implications then of God's love? I want to consider two. The first, we must receive the love of God. Again, verse 9 tells us, God has sent His only Son into the world that we might live through Him. We live through Christ. All true life comes from God. And eternal life comes from the Father through the Son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So how do we escape not perishing? By receiving this beautiful, incomprehensible gift of life through Jesus. That if we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead, we shall be saved. Praise God. So if you're here this morning and you're listening to this message about God's love, but you've never committed yourself to the Lord and received that gift of life, that gift of forgiveness, that gift of love, let me encourage you to do that today. Just in your own words, admit to God, I'm a sinner. Pastor Greg doesn't have to tell me that. I know that. My conscience condemns me. I know I'm a sinner. But Lord, I want to be saved. I want to know you. I want to know what life is all about. Will you come and forgive me of my sins and enter my life? Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. He will receive us. And he himself has invited us Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So how do we respond to the love of God? We respond by receiving Jesus Christ. We receive the love of God through Him. But then there's a second implication, and this one has 
far-reaching uh, consequences for us as Christians. We must walk in the love of God. Not just receive it, but walk in it. Again, verse 11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So what does that look like? Ephesians 5 and 2. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. So how has Christ loved us? Well, he loved us with a love that was self-initiating and sacrificial. So what does that mean for us as human beings living in this sin-soiled world where it's so easy to hurt each other, where it's so easy to offend each other, where it's so easy to transgress against each other? Well, one thing that it means as Christians, we do not have the privilege of sitting back and saying, well, they're the ones that are wrong. They need to come to me. We don't have that privilege. We, we don't. Because God is the only one who really has that privilege and he didn't exercise it. His love for us was self-initiating. Think about where we would be if God had said, well, I'm the one offended. I created them out of nothing. I gave them life itself and this is how they repay me? No, no. But instead, while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. So as Christians, whether we've been offended or sinned against by the world or by our brothers and sisters, as an act of love and a sign of spiritual fruit, it is our responsibility to be the initiators and say, let's live in love. Let's clear the air. You know, whatever has happened, let's put it in the past. Let's forgive each other and let's walk in forgiveness. Amen? Self-initiating. And then that's the kind of love that is self-sacrificing. Because sometimes we've got to sacrifice our sense of justice, or maybe I should say injustice, when we've been wronged. It takes more strength. It takes more uh, surrender, more yieldedness to be able to lay aside an injustice, especially a great injustice. Does it not? It takes more spiritual maturity to do that than it does to forgive someone who comes to us and says, Wow, my eyes have been opened. I see how I hurt you. I didn't get it before, but I do now. Will you forgive me? But when a person's not willing to do that, that, at least in our own way, in our own heart, we need to be willing to say, I forgive. I forgive. As I have been forgiven, so I forgive. A self-initiating love that is also sacrificial. And friends, I believe that as a church, you know, there are times that we do that. But I believe that as any group of people this side of heaven, it's hit and miss. <laughs> you know, because we're still working it out, right? And we still have the old nature that we battle against. And I'm, I'm thrilled to say that there are times when we get it right. My encouragement to you and to myself at the end of a year as we're standing at the threshold of a new year Let's determine by the grace of God as we cross over into 2018 to say we're going to open our lives to this kind of self-initiating sacrificial love so that we can love each other even as Christ has loved us. And in so doing, the world will know that our God is alive and well and that we are followers of him. Amen. God loves us, so let us love each other. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, today we have once again just been in awe at who you are. That when we come to the scriptures and we give ourselves to serious study, we walk away not only inspired, but dumbstruck. Just simply beyond words. We serve a God who is so great. 
And yet, and yet, Lord, we are moved even more by the fact that you love us. That you, as God, who has need of nothing, for the sake of your glory, have chosen to love us with an everlasting love. I pray, Father, that we will find our rest in that love. And I pray that we will purpose in our hearts to express that kind of love each and every day. Enable us by your spirit, encourage us by your word, help us to live those lives of love that will bring you glory and honor. And now, Lord, as we prepare our hearts to give back to you a portion of that which you've given to us, we pray that you would take these offerings and that you would use them for the furtherance of the gospel message. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you give to the Lord's work.